Let's look at, uh, let's go back to the book of Mark. We're getting into the last week that Jesus lived on this earth, the, the week that he was crucified. And so we're going to be looking, uh, that you look at, we're here at Mark chapter 11, goes through 16, a lot of chapters here about this part, a lot of stories coming up right up to the last. And this is where Jesus finds a fig tree and there's leaves and he goes to eat the figs, but there's no figs. So that's why I've titled this, Nothing but leaves. Now let's read the story and then I'm going to show you what Matthew says and we'll put it together and then we're going to go through it again and notice some particular things about this event. One thing to notice is that Jesus is going to, what, what we say, it, curse the fig tree. He's going to put a curse on the fig tree and the fig tree is going to wither. And that is very different than what we think of as Jesus' miracles. Jesus is all about healing and restoring in his miracles, but this time he does something that causes that fig tree harm. And we're going to see why he did that and understand this event with the fig tree. So let's read the story. Mark 11 and verse 12. And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, no man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. And they come to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught, saying unto them, It is, is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations a house of prayer, and ye have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and the priests heard it, and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him, because all the people was astonished at his doctrine. And when even was come, he went out of the city, and in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Mark is telling this sequentially. Here's what happened this day and, and then that day. But the mention of the fig tree early and then the cleansing of the temple and then the mention of the fig tree again is deliberate. Because that cleansing of the temple is going to help us understand what Jesus did with that fig tree. Let me show you how Matthew writes it. Matthew tells the story, and Matthew's not telling it in sequence as much. Matthew's kind of pushing the fig tree story together more compactly. So let's see what Matthew says. Matthew 21, 18 through 20. Now in the morning as he returned into the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only. And he said unto it, let no fruit grow on thee henceforward forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled saying, how soon is the fig tree withered away? You know, if you read Matthew and you didn't have Mark, you'd get the idea that Jesus said that to the fig tree and immediately it just withered. But we know from Mark that they recognized that it had withered the next morning. That word presently doesn't mean on that moment, but it withered rather quickly to have gone from a green fig tree to one dried from the roots in one day. Now, 
Let's get back in the mark and see some specifics here. On the morrow, the last time we were in Mark, and if you look earlier in this chapter, is when Jesus rode that donkey into Jerusalem with that triumphant entry, and they cut down the branches and laid it before him, and he goes into the temple with people shouting, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And he goes into the temple, and he looks around, and that evening he returns back to Bethany. That was the first day of the week. It, it, it's not obvious, but you go through, you figure it out. That's why they call it Palm Sunday, the Sunday before the, the Resurrection Sunday that they call Easter Sunday. Those aren't Bible words for those Sundays, but you'll find that on your calendar. On the morrow. So we're talking about Monday morning now. I want to keep up with this as we go through Mark because see if we can keep up with the days of the week coming up to the crucifixion on Friday and the resurrection on that next Sunday. So now, Monday, they're coming from Bethany and it says he was hungry. That, you might read past that, but Jesus was here in the flesh. And one of the reasons he came in the flesh was to suffer the infirmities of the flesh with us. You've been hungry, and Jesus knows what that feels like. It's not the first time he was hungry. You remember he had fasted 40 days in the wilderness, and he hungered. And that's when the devil came to him tempting him to turn those stones into bread. Remember that? You remember that time he came to the woman uh, he, he came to the well. He came to Jacob's well and he was tired and he was thirsty and he was hungry. And the disciples went to buy food when the woman came up and he asked for a drink. The woman at the well, we talk about it. You know, at the end of that story, the disciples come with the food and they said, here, eat. And he's already refreshed. He says, I have meat to eat, you know not of. It's not that he had a little lunch hidden away somewhere. There's another kind of hunger. There is a spiritual hunger. Jesus talks about those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. And Jesus knew a bit of spiritual hunger as well. He was hungry for those who wanted to know who he was and what he was about and was interested in him. And you remember how those Samaritans had come out to him and heard from him and were believing in him. And that's what fed him spiritually. Well, now he's both. He's hungry physically, but he's hungry spiritually because things aren't right in Jerusalem. So... He sees a fig tree afar off having leaves. He came, if happily he might find anything thereon. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. Well, let me see if I can explain why it was he would look for figs on a fig tree when it wasn't even time for figs. I think I can explain that. There's a couple of explanations. One is that... Um, uh, well, when the fig trees would put out leaves, they would also put the fruit out at the same time. Now, these would be the little green fruits right at the beginning. So if you saw leaves, you'd expect fruit, but it wouldn't be ripe fruit. So the time for the figs to be ripe and sweet and juicy had not come, but maybe he was expecting to see some little green figs. The other is... And those that deal with plants like this understand that plants aren't all the same. I mean, you might have a, you might have a dozen blueberry bushes and uh, only one of them bear one year. Yeah, that plant is kind of unique. Every plant's a little unique. And then it could be what we call microclimates. Like this fig may have been planted in a place that, where it would have produced early because it was out of the wind and in the sunlight and in the warmth. And, and so it had leaves early. And so that's why otherwise it wouldn't have been a time of fruit. But this one's just a little ahead of the others. 
It could have been that. Let me show you this. There's a fig tree out there by itself. Now, this one's leafed out pretty good. I got a little fig tree at home, and um, it doesn't... These leaves don't come on it all of a sudden. You, there's just little few scattered green leaves as it begins to bloom. And this would have been early, so it wouldn't have been leafed out this much. But let me show you a picture of a ripe fig on a tree. Now, that's what mine looks like uh, when you get into September. And if you know the taste of fresh, ripe figs, from a tree, your mouth might be watering right now. You can't hardly buy these anywhere. I mean, you pick them, and the next day they're not as good as they are like they are like this. Look how plump and fresh and ripe that looks. Well, it wasn't time for those kind of figs yet, but those are really a delight. In fact, some people think that Eve was tempted with a fig. You know, the idea is Eve tempted with an apple, it doesn't say. But some think it was a fig because it said they sewed fig leaves together to hide their nakedness. So some think, well, maybe it was a fig. And if you've ever tasted uh, fresh, juicy, sweet figs like this, you could, you could understand how that could be a temptation. So that's not what Jesus saw. He probably saw something like this. Or that's what he was expecting. When it first leaves out, there are these little bitty green figs. Now, knowing this story, I have gone to my little fig tree when they've come out like this to eat those, and I'll tell you, they're not very good. <laughs> uh, it's more like eating a, a vegetable that's not seasoned very well, and I didn't really care for it. But as I read about this, those little green figs did provide some nutrition. If you were hungry, you could get a little nutrition out of these little green figs. Solomon talks about these in the Song of Solomon. In the springtime of the year, the low winter is past and rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of the singing of birds has come. The voice of the turtle is heard in the land. Now, that'd be a turtle dove. The fig tree putteth forth her green figs. So that's what Jesus comes to this tree expecting to find because if the fig tree is going to bear figs, the little green figs appear when the leaves appear. The leaves are like saying, look, I have figs. That's what you would expect when you see the leaves. He got there and there was just leaves. There's no figs. So Jesus said, no man shall eat of the fruit hereafter, uh, of the hereafter forever. Well, it was something because the disciples took note how he had said that. And he goes on into Jerusalem. When he gets there, he goes into the temple and it's a mess. They are desecrating that temple. This holy place, this place where you have come to feed your soul on the spiritual things and there's merchants in there. They're buying and selling. They're trying to get gain. And people carrying their merchandise into the city are just walking right through the temple grounds on their way, using it like a common street. And so Jesus began to cast them out that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of money changers and the seats that sold doves and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught them, saying, is it not written, my house? How would you like it to come to your house at the church? You go to your house, and there's people in there messing it up and doing all kinds of things and walking through it just like they don't care if it's yours or not. You get out of my house. My house, he says. All nations are supposed to see this as a house of prayer. Either all nations could come to pray there, but even if it was just for the Jews, the nations would see that is a holy place and a house of prayer, and it would be a sign to the nations. And you've turned it into a den of thieves. They're in there trying to make money off folks that have come needing money for sacrifice or needing animals for sacrifice, probably cheating them as they're doing it, and he's not going to have it. So... The scribes and Pharisees hear this. Now Jesus is very 
popular among the people. And they probably didn't like seeing this done in their temple anyway. So Jesus does this. And the scribes and Pharisees see it. And they saw how they might destroy him. For they feared him because all the people were astonished at his doctrine. Now he was there that day, Monday evening, he returns back to Bethany. He goes out of the city. Maybe he went home a different way. But now it's Tuesday morning. And as the morning they passed by and saw the fig is dried up from the roots. That's pretty quick to go from a leafy green fig to one dried from the roots from one morning to the next. Uh, Luke does not tell us about this, but Luke tells us something similar. In a parable Jesus told, a certain man had a fig tree planted in a vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he to the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on the fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it cumber the ground? And he answered and said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year till I shall dig about it and dung it and it bear fruit well. If not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. That's the parable. You know, Jesus went on his public ministry those three years to Jerusalem. From the time he first cleansed that temple to the second, there's probably about a three year, could have been four. He'd come looking for that nourishment. It never came. It never came. Cut it down. But the mercy of God, let's try again. Let's wait. But 35 years later, that temple was leveled so that not one stone is left upon another. You see, it had all the leaves. It looked like a holy place. It looked like a place you could go get spiritually fed. But it was spiritually barren. And like that fig tree withered away. All the way down to the roots. That temple is uprooted and destroyed. Not one stone on another. There's one place where you can go to a whaling wall. Which was one of the outer abutments that held the ground back for the foundation to where that temple was. That's the best they've got left of that old temple. The fig tree illustrated the barrenness of what was taking place in that temple. It was all leaves. No substance. There's another story. John doesn't tell about the fig tree, but John says something about this, and this gets more individual. I'm the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. John 15:1. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. And then down to verse 6. If a man abide not in me, he's cast forth as a branch and is withered. Kind of like that fig tree, isn't it? And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they're burned. What's the principle here? Okay, you can talk about that temple. Oh boy, it looks, looks great. It's beautiful. It's all set up. Everybody think, man, this is a holy place. And you get in there and there's no substance to it. They've corrupted it. They've made it worldly. They're treating it like something common. But now he's talking about every man. And this gets individual. And now let's think about us. It's one thing to appear religious. It's another thing to be of spiritual substance. And we don't want our religion to just be an outward show, do we? We want to bear fruit. We want it to be something that, that we want to be what God wants us to be. And bear that spiritual fruit and not just look religious like the Pharisees would look, but they were spiritually barren. I'm going to make this application that I like to make every now and then. 
few weeks ago, I took a picture of this. I didn't get a picture today. I thought I might replace it, but I didn't. But that's our sign. That's what it looks like at night out there. And I was advertising the singing at Bonner. But look what it says above. And this is out there all the time. Rockcliffe Church of Christ. Now you're spiritually hungry. And you see a sign. And it says Christ. What do you think you'll find? If you attend the services and come in the building. You're spiritually hungry. And the leaves are out there. This is what we have. The living water. The living bread. You can find Christ. And if that's what we say on a sign outside, that's what we need to be on the inside, isn't it? We don't want to be cursed like that fig tree. We don't want to be cut off like those branches. We don't want to be leveled like that temple. If we're going to put out the leaves, let's bear the fruit. Now, Paul would write to the book to the church at Corinth. Now, they had a lot of problems, but there were things about that church. He'd said, I praise you, brethren. And I can say that from this pulpit as one of the elders here, and I look out among the people I'm seeing here, I can praise you because I see a lot of that fruit. But let this be a warning and a reminder to us that that's because that's what we need to do. We need to bear fruit in our lives. And those who come to us with spiritual hunger need to be able to find spiritual substance. And that's what we're reminded of by the story of the fig tree. Well, now with that, let me extend the invitation. We want you to come to Christ. If you've come looking for Christ here, you've come to where you need to be. We're going to open the Bible. We're going to study about Christ. We're going to preach Christ. We're going to worship the Lamb that liveth forever and ever. And that's the spiritual food that you need for your soul. And you'll partake of that, not just by hearing it, but by believing it and obeying it, and becoming everything God wants you to be. If you need to be baptized into Christ, we can do that. And then if you need to grow spiritually, our teachers and our preachers and elders, and we're going to do what we can to feed you spiritually so we can grow and bear that fruit God wants us to be. If you need to respond to the invitation, then do it while we stand and sing.